Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Tonight, I just want to read the first seven verses. Isaiah 55, 1 through 7. This is now the word of God. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Let's pray. Father, we come to you again this evening, and it's a delight to do so. Lord, um, we love your people. We love to gather together. We love to visit and share, and Lord God, lift one another up and encourage and be encouraged, Father. Uh, just the congregational gathering is a blessing to us. We thank you for that, that uh, we have this privilege and we have this joy, and Lord, we, we just praise you for that. We thank you, Lord, for the right and the privilege and the ability to sing and to worship for those you've provided to, to lead us in that, these ladies that play the instruments and Leo who leads, Lord, we're, we're grateful for the talents that you've given them and their willingness to serve and that we can gather and sing and lift our voices for your glory, Lord, we, we love that. And we thank you, God, for the privilege of having your word, not only that you have preserved it for us, but Father, that you've given it to us at all, that you saw fit to reveal yourself, that you entered our realm that you might reveal truth and then God you ordained to have it written down and you ordained to preserve it through all these generations that we have a copy of it and you give us your spirit that we might understand it and know your very thoughts Lord God it is a privilege then for us to spend a moment and open this book and to gaze upon it and to ponder it and to meditate and to think and uh, Lord to listen to your spirit as we read and uh, Father have it applied to our lives Lord, there's so much value and treasure in here. We just praise you for it. We thank you for it. We pray that tonight, uh, God, you speak again. You know our hearts. You know, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know when we sit and when we rise. Uh, Lord, we couldn't flee anywhere from your presence. You're the one that knows our hearts. And so, Lord God, you know what we need to hear. And may your spirit through your word bring that truth to us. We pray for conviction. We pray for encouragement. We pray for clarity God we pray that you would work and speak in a way that we would understand and comprehend and that Lord it might lead us to you and draw us nearer to you and that you might be glorified God That's, these are the things we pray for and so God speak tonight and we ask it in Jesus name amen I really don't want to give much recap from this morning it was just a few hours ago that we sat through and studied it and so I really want to kind of just dive back into chapter 55 uh, I will remind you that we're dealing with what we're calling the call of salvation. This is God's call. It is more than just his general universal call, though in effect every call of God is general and universal. Anyone who hears this message and responds to it can be saved. That's always been true. It will always be true. But Isaiah 55 is more of what we would call God's effectual call. This is the call in which God is calling his own and they will come, which God promises in chapter 11 that his word will not return into him void. What I am doing will be accomplished, God says. And so we're looking not just at a generic call of salvation to whomever, although it is, we're looking even deeper than that to a specific call to Israel. Those who have rejected him, even in the Old Testament, and now currently have rejected Christ and thus rejected God. And God even speaks of the day when he brings them home, when he will bring them back. And he will do that. 
as he speaks even here, it is an effectual call of God. He knows who are his. Christ paid the debt for those who are his, and they are coming back. That's reality. And we said we're breaking this call of God up into six points just to help us understand a little bit about God's call of salvation. The first point, I'll just give it to you briefly again, is what we called this morning, God's call is an abundant call. And this was the first three verses, and it's not hard to find. He actually states that in verse 2, that you will delight yourself in abundance. It is a call to those who are thirsty. It is a call to those who are poor. They have no money to buy and eat. It is a call to those who have messed up their life because they have spent their wages and they spent their money on what would not satisfy. And so they're idolatrous, they're rebellious, they're foolish. And because of their bad decisions, they found themselves in a state of poverty and a barren land and dryness and thirst. And even though they've made a wreck of their lives... God calls to them that if you will listen carefully to me, you will eat what is good. You will delight yourself in abundance. You will live. It's an abundant call of God to those who are humble, we said this morning, to those who will hear the call, we said this morning, and to those who hunger enough that when they hear the call, they come. They come and follow Christ. Luke chapter 6, verse 20 says, And turning his gaze toward his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. What looks like the worst possible human earthly condition is actually the best, because you are now in a prime position to be saved by the Lord. He came to save sinners he is living water to the woman at the well he is the bread of life to a starving crowd he is the good shepherd to the lost sheep he is the life and life abundant to all who are broken it is God calling sinners to himself and it is an abundant call we saw that this morning well let's move on tonight the second aspect of God's call it is an anticipated call God's call is an anticipated call and I want to read again verses three to five incline your ear and come to me listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Now, at the very least, we ought to pay attention to the beginning of verse 3, which we sort of overlap with from this morning, in which God says, incline your ear, come to me, listen that you may live. That, that in itself is a good statement. It's speaking to people who deserve death, and it's spoken to people who are on the verge of death. They have brought this on themselves, but they are at the very end, we might say at their wit's end, but also they are at the end of all hope, and the Lord asked them, do you want to live? It reminds me and brings to our memory that throwaway baby story in Ezekiel chapter 16. Remember that one that was born and tossed in the field and no one cared for it. No one rubbed it with salt and just threw it out there to die. And Ezekiel 16, 6, God says, When I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I said to you while you're in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you while you're in your blood, live. There was no worth. There was no value. Uh, death was imminent. But God determined to give life. That's a glorious reality. And that's still what's on the table here. I will move you from death to life. I will restore to you what is broken. I will fix it. I will revive you. I will make you new. These are all New Testament gospel promises, right? That who is dead will live. That which is lost will be found. It's all the promises of God in the gospel. But we're going to see more than that because God here, in Israel's case, specifically speaks to them as to what he means when he says you may live. You say, what do you mean, God, at least in the ramification for the nation of Israel? And this is what he means. Verse the end of verse 3, he says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. If you teach Sunday school or you've ever preached or you've ever tried to do a Bible study, you know that every time you go through a chapter or a passage, it's almost inevitable that there's going to be that one verse or one sentence or one phrase that makes you go, what? What are you talking about? You have to dig a little more. You have to study a little more for this is the one here. What in the world is being said? Some parts of it are simple, and we'll start there. It's clear that in some reality, God is speaking about what we call the Davidic covenant, right? That's clear. We see that. There's a covenant that was made with David. 
And this seems to be the subject of what Isaiah is talking about. So let's start there. What is the Davidic covenant? 2 Samuel 7 says this. When your day, this is God speaking to David. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and with the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. That's the Davidic covenant to David. He speaks of Solomon. Solomon's coming next. If he messes up, I'll chastise him, which God did. But it won't matter how bad he sins. It won't matter how bad he messes up. That throne, David, is yours forever. Psalm 89, 27 says, I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever. And my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. That's the promise God made to David. You will always have a descendant on the throne. That's even been very important in Isaiah's day. You remember Isaiah chapter 9 for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And so the promise to David is clear. His lineage will last forever. God will never let the line of David pass. And even more than that, God has one descendant of David on the way who will usher in what is a glorious reality for Israel. Isaiah actually said there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Now, we can stop there and say that would be an anticipated promise. Would we agree with that? I mean, especially if you're Israel, wow, we're waiting for that day. We're really looking forward to the day when David's descendant arises and sits on the throne and he reigns there forever and there's no end to the increase of his government or the increase of his peace. That's what we call putting Israel back on the map. That's an anticipated promise. We're looking forward to that, Lord. But even in our day, we look for that, don't we? We call it the millennial reign. When Christ comes back and he reigns upon the throne and he reigns on the earth and he reigns from Jerusalem and the, the whole world is put to peace. And remember, this is when the wolf dwells with the lamb and the ox uh, plays with the bear and the little kid plays with the cobra. And I mean, yeah, sign me up for that. This is what we call an anticipated promise. And this is what something is God is tying to his call here because he tells these people from Israel when you repent, when you come to me, when you listen to me, this is what I will do. I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. But even that statement is a little, I get that you're talking about the Davidic covenant, but what do you mean exactly? What is being said here? And so let me walk you through this phrase the way I walked through this phrase, and maybe that'll help you understand what Isaiah is saying. First of all, if you're reading the same translation as me, you notice the words according to their italics. They're not part of the original Hebrew. They're just added by a translator to try to help make that statement a little more understandable. So the translator of this, of the New American Standard, said, I'm going to put according to in there, and that'll help it make sense possibly. So those words aren't even there to begin with. Secondly, the word shown, when he talks about the faithful mercy shown to David, shown there is actually not in the Hebrew either. It's kind of an implied word, I guess, that it's for David, but even that word is not there in the Hebrew. Thirdly, the word mercy is there. It's your favorite word. It's the Hebrew word chesed. That's that loyal covenantal love of God, right? It's, it's more than God's faithfulness. It's his loyalty to do what he says he will do and to always promise to do it. That's the word there. And finally, that word faithful in the verse is a word that literally means to confirm or confirmation. Now, I know that's a lot to give you, but these are just some of the things I worked through on those two lines to try to make sense of it. And if you look at it with some of that understanding, here's also what can be being said. That God can look to these people who say, if you will listen to me or when you listen to me and when you hear me and when you come to me, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The confirmation of Hesed to David. What is being said is not just some sort of random statement, but it is God saying, I know you are thirsty and hungry. 
I know you have wasted all your wages on what did not satisfy, but when you come to me, I will give you life. In fact, I will confirm the promises I made to David. When you come to me, I'm putting that covenant into effect. That would mean that the promise on the table from God here is that when you return to me and when you answer my call, I will send David who will come and restore Israel to a place of prominence. That's what he's saying. And this, by the way, is in agreement with the New Testament when Peter preaches in Jerusalem in Acts 3. Peter says, and now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. In other words, Peter said he's done suffering. That's over. Therefore, here's the message to Israel. This is Peter preaching. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive into the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. Peter looked at the city that crucified the Lord and said, if you'll repent and return, he will send Jesus. That is, send Jesus back, and he will come back to usher in the times of refreshing. He will come to usher in this period of restoration. What is that? That's the millennium, right? That's when the curse is reversed, and Christ comes and restores all things back to the way they're supposed to be. And that's exactly what God is saying here through Isaiah. He's offering the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. When you humble yourself, and when you hear my word, and you're hungry enough to come to me, that's when I will fulfill this covenant. And he gives more explanation as to what he means by that. Verse 4, behold, I have made him, and the him there honestly ought to be a capital H him, because we're talking about the descendant of David. I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Verse 5, he now talks to the descendant of David. So you should be a capital U. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. In other words, what we have saying here is God that announces when you return to me, I'll send him to you and he will rule the world. He, he will stand before all the people. He'll be like a, a signal or a sign to all the peoples. He'll be a leader and a commander of all peoples. And nations that you don't even know about will be drawn to you. Nations that you've never even thought about will come to you. And they will serve you. And they will worship at his feet. And they will, they will all yield to the nation. I'll do that for you. I'll restore you back to that place of prominence. When you come to me, Zechariah chapter 8 speaks of the millennial reign. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. I mean, we just want to go back with you. We, we want to be there. You remember all those promises then of the Mosaic covenant and God lays them out in Deuteronomy 28. First comes the promises. If you will fully obey me, if you'll do every, if you'll be careful, he says, to do all that I've commanded you then I'll bless you. And he lays out the blessings. And then he says, however, if you, if you don't obey everything, then I'll curse you. And he lays out the curses. Well, we focus a lot on the curses because that happened to be the path that Israel walked. They did, in fact, disobey, and all those curses were theirs. However, listen to the blessings in Deuteronomy 28, 7. The Lord shall cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way and will flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you and your barns and all that you put your hand to, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God will give you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he swore to you if you keep the commandment of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. So all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will be afraid of you. The Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the offspring of your body and the offspring of your beast and the produce of your ground and the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you only will be above and you will not be underneath. If you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe them carefully and do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them now the statement from Moses was if God's people would merely be righteous in God's sight then he would bless them they weren't and so they were cursed ultimately even being kicked out of the land but as we've said everything taking place now in 54 and following is a whole new offer based on what chapter 53 right 
He came and atoned. He came and saved. He came and redeemed. He came and paid the debt. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced through for our transgressions. All of our iniquity was laid on him. And that means when you come to him, that which was not righteous is declared righteous. And when you're righteous in the sight of God, what sort of life do you inherit from the Father? Blessing. What do we know about the church? We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Is that not true? He has withheld nothing from us in Christ. We have all the blessings. He has promised that I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Even death can't stop my church. And we live, church, in a spiritual kingdom under that spiritual reality where we live under the blessing of God. There's no doubt about that. We live under his spiritual blessing. We live in his kingdom. We are a foreshadow, if you will, of what God will one day do in a physical sense for the nation of Israel. When they come back, and they will, when they come back, Christ will return, the kingdom will be set up, and what we understand in the spiritual blessing realm now will be understood throughout the world in a physical blessing realm. And this is what God is promising. It's an anticipated call of God. This is what we've been waiting for. And I just simply want to point out to you, again, that the plans God has for you are good plans. He's not trying to ruin your life. He's not trying to mess up everything for you. So many people get this idea. That's what's floating through the minds. Those guys we talked about this morning, the guy says, I'll follow you anywhere. Jesus says, well, look, I'm homeless. You'll be homeless. The guy that says, I'll follow you, but but let me first collect my inheritance. The guy that says, I will follow, but I want to keep my reputation intact. So let me go talk to everybody at home before I come. And they all have in the back of their mind that in some way, form, or fashion, following Jesus is a ripoff. He must be cheating me. Because if I go with him now, look at everything I lose, right? That's the mentality. Look at what I lose if I follow Christ. And there's so many, Satan Satan loves to do this too. But he loves to put it in your mind that if I follow Christ, here's what I'm going to lose. And following Christ has never been about what you're going to lose. Following Christ has always been about what you gain, isn't it? In fact, Paul says, whenever I took everything I lost and I set it beside everything I gained, do you know what I equated the value of everything I lost to? Poop. That's what he says. I counted as dung. That's his word in Philippians 3. It was dung. It was less than valuable. It was was something that you throw away and discard. I don't even want it anymore. Did God cheat Paul? No. What I gained, he says, is so much more valuable than what I lost. We love that parable of the, the, the treasure in the field. We love that parable of the pearl of great value. This man, he's not a good guy. He's a treasure hunter, and he's hunting for treasure in a field he doesn't own. That ought to tell you everything about him. He finds this treasure in this field, and he's not not the kind of guy with scruples that runs and tells the owner of the field, dude, you are so lucky. You've got this massive treasure in your field. He doesn't do that. What's he do? He buries it again, right? He buries it because this is the most valuable thing he's ever seen. And he says, I know what I need to do. I need to buy the field. Now, that field is worth, you know, let's say the field is worth $1,000. That field with that treasure is worth immeasurably more well I can't afford the treasure but I can afford the field if I get rid of everything if I liquidate everything I own I can scrape together a thousand dollars so this guy goes home he sells his donkeys he sells his plows he sells his sheep he sells his land he rents out his wife and kids I reckon I don't know he sells everything he's got and he scrapes together barely a thousand dollars and he runs to the guy who owns the field and says I want to buy this field for a thousand dollars and somebody says why would he give up everything clearly this guy is about stuff he's a treasure hunter he likes stuff why would he get rid of all his stuff because what he found is so much more valuable than anything he could possibly lose it is worth it same with the guy same point to the guy selling pearls or, or merchant seeking pearls he sells everything to get the pearl this is what God is pointing out to these people When I'm telling you to come for me, it's not just about being thirsty and satisfied. It's not just about life and life abundant, although it is. But I have in store for you a plan that you cannot possibly fathom. I I don't know what it's going to be like in heaven. I don't know when, when the Bible speaks of storing up treasure in heaven. I don't have a barometer to know what treasure in heaven feels like. I don't, I don't know. I don't have any way of understanding what, what that's going to be like. All I do know is this. 
it's going to be so much more and so much greater than anything you've ever had crossed between your ears. You can't even fathom it. And that's what Paul said. I saw things which a man is not permitted to speak. Uh, and Paul would say repeatedly, listen, I'm going to tell you, it's worth it. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed. I can't tell you exactly what it is. He won't let me. I'm just telling you it's worth it. More than you can fathom. More than you can imagine. And this is what God says here. What have you anticipated? I, I know when we come to Christ, we want forgiveness. We want mercy. We, uh, we want peace with God. We, we want the sort of the joy and fellowship of the church and of our family. And there are a lot of spiritual blessings you want from Christ. But have you ever thought about heaven? Have you ever thought what you want it to be like? And I'm not saying you get to determine what heaven's like. But have you ever contemplated how good it could be? What would it be like if we actually got a real leader like Jesus on the earth? who ruled and reigned and everything reigned in righteousness, how good this place could be if the curse was reversed and all of a sudden the ground spit out corn instead of goat heads, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? And now God says, everything I've been saying, that's what I'm going to do. This isn't a negative promise from God. It's something to be anticipated. When God extends his offer call to salvation, it ought to be something that you respond and say, finally, I've been waiting for him to call. I've been sitting here waiting for him to call and ask me to come. I can't wait to come. I can't wait to get there. What he's got in store for me is so much better than anything I've ever imagined in this life. That's the reality of the call of God. It's an abundant call. It's an anticipated call. Let's look at one more tonight. Number three, God's call is an available call. It's an available call. Look at verses six and seven. Very important verse. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. I mean, we literally just saw how Peter presented a call to Israel to repent and return. Even on the heels of them crucifying the Christ, even though they have been broken off by God, Peter's extending a call. So in one sense, the call is always available. That's what we've said. I mean, they sell Bibles all over America. It's all on the airwaves. You can watch it on, on the internet. You can watch it on TV. So there is a sense in which God's call has always been available. But implied here is more than that. We're not just talking about that universal call. We're talking about that effectual call. And the point I want to make to you first in verse 6 that I want you to, to sort of grasp and ponder on is that the call of salvation is on God's timing, not yours. Okay? I want you to understand that. The call of salvation is on God's timing, not yours. Isaiah is very clear when he says, Seek the Lord when? While he may be found. Call upon him when? While he is near. And while God's call is universal in the sense that it's always going forth, God's effectual call is not. For someone to sort of just hold to the idea that, you know, I'll just wait and come to Christ when I'm ready. Now, there used to be the mentality, maybe it still runs through teenagers a little bit, you know, that, well, there's a lot of stuff I want to do first. There's a lot of fun I want to have. There's a lot of things I want to accomplish. And, and after I've done all the stuff I want to do, the stuff they won't let you do if you're in church, I'll go do all that and then... I'll believe in Jesus and I'll give my life to Jesus and I'll come back in time to die and go to heaven. That, you know, they all want to follow the blueprint of the thief on the cross. That's a foolish, foolish miscalculation. Let me put it to you like this. Let's talk about Lazarus, four days dead. He's lying in the tomb and all of a sudden Jesus makes him alive enough to be able to hear him. And Lazarus, who's been dead, all of a sudden hears, Lazarus, come forth. Gets up comes out of the tomb here's my question could Lazarus have come out after being dead for three days how about after being dead for two days could he have come out then how about for one day could he have come out after one day dead no why the Lord had to call him he's dead right and until Jesus awakens him to life and calls him out he can't come so who was it up to the timing of Lazarus resurrection yeah it's God's it's the Lord's think about Saul of Tarsus He's breathing out threats against the church until that day on the road to Damascus, Jesus, I always picture knocking him off his horse. I don't know if he was or he wasn't, but Jesus knocked him to the ground and blinded him with light and called him to salvation. And Saul repents and trusts in Christ. And the question is, could Saul have come days before? 
And you might say, well, yeah, he could have, but let's be honest about the hardened heart of Saul. The answer is no. He wasn't coming. That wasn't on his agenda. That wasn't his plan. He wasn't even looking for Jesus the day that he found him, which is the case for all of us, by the way. And the point is that it's on God's timing. And so the call of salvation, you must respond when the offer is made. And let me explain why. There's a couple of reasons why it works this way. First, let's talk about depravity. You have what we know to be sinful man. You are born in sin, conceived in iniquity. That's reality. We were all killed in Adam. He's our federal head. We've talked a lot about this. It's going to come up in Romans 5. If you're still confused, come on Wednesday nights and listen to Youth Plus You, and we'll talk about it some more. But we're born dead. That means you're born with a sinful inclination. That's how you enter this world. You were born, according to Ephesians 2, dead in your trespasses and sins. And you're always seeking the things of the world. That, that's what you want. You don't want Christ, and even if you did, you couldn't come to him because you're dead. This is why Jesus makes statements like John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. That, that's like saying Lazarus can't come out until I tell him to come out, and that's true. In John 6, 65, he was saying, For this reason I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. It's a simple point. Man doesn't have the capacity to come whenever he wants. He must come when God offers. John 12, 35, Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. It's on his timing, not yours. Human depravity makes it so. You don't have an inclination or a will to want to follow Christ unless he awakens your eyes and ears and causes you to want to do it. That's reality. There's depravity to deal with. There's a second reason to deal with, and that's what we're going to call neglect. And what you have is the reality of man who, because of his own hardness, squanders his opportunities. We think of that parable of the wedding feast, right? The king's wanting to throw a wedding feast for his son, and he sent out invitations, and he said, the feast is ready, all is prepared. Come to the wedding feast. And what they do? Each man went to his own way, right? Some of them even wrote back excuses. Sorry, I bought two mules and I got to work them. Sorry, I bought land and I got to look at them. Sorry, I bought a wife and she won't, or I bought a wife. Got a wife and she won't let, he might have bought her, I don't know. I got a wife and she won't let me come, right? And, and all these excuses, what do we call that? We call that neglect. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 2, for if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What could be considered a greater waste of life than for Jesus to literally spend three years preaching in your region and you still haven't made it around to listening to him? That'd be neglect, right? And humanity is prone to it. Luke chapter 19, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. So there's, there's the problems of just this depraved heart that wants nothing to do with Christ, and then there's the problem of this sort of neglectful, lazy heart that just never gets around to it, and that, that is prominent in humanity. That's just kind of what we are by nature. And so we don't just come by nature unless God orchestrates we come. But there's a third reason why God has to call it, and it's the reason I'm just going to call judgment. And what we're talking about is a supernatural hardening from God. How many times have we read Romans 1 lately? And we talk about that three-time used phrase, which is terrifying, in which it says, "Over, therefore God gave them over. Therefore God gave them over. That's a judgment, right? Where God said, fine, you want sin, you can have it. I'll leave you alone terrifying spot to be in when God determines to leave you alone when God determines just to let you have your sin and live in it and never warn you about it again you find yourself in that position you're in a bad bad way you don't want to be there but Romans 11 says this about Israel what then what Israel is seeking it has not obtained but those who were chosen obtained it and the rest were hardened and just as it is written God gave them a spirit of stupor Eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. That's a judicial punishment of God in which God took a people and said, no, not today. You can't. No, he hardened. Go read the story of Pharaoh in Exodus and notice what it says over and over and over. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You're not coming. 
Why? Because the offer is on God's timing, not yours. God is not, contrary to popular evangelical belief, sitting up there in heaven, biting his nails and twiddling his thumbs, just hoping someone will come today. That is not how this thing works. He's not some weakling deity that just wishes he could convince you to come down the aisle. Oh, if I just could. You know, we always got those images. Jesus just patiently knocking on the door, just begging and hoping and pleading that you'll let him in. It's not the way this operates. You come when he calls. You ladies, how many of you propose to your husband? How many of you are ready to marry him long before he proposed? There weren't any hands there either, right? <laughs> how many of you have yet to reach a point where you know just Tammy nodded yes a little bit, like Les took a little bit too long, right? I'm ready to get married, but he just won't ask, right? It was on his timing, not hers. That's reality. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. That means if you reach a point in your life when God opens your heart and you hear the gospel and you understand the gospel and there is a a draw on your heart to respond to the gospel, what should you do? Respond to the gospel. That's called your chance, your opportunity, right? Come to him. You don't know if you'll ever hear the gospel again. You don't know. I mean, everybody says if you were to die tonight, which is possible. We, we don't know. You're not assured of tomorrow. But I, I realize, especially when you're, long, you're young, you're like, yeah, well, I ain't going to die tonight. Okay. Well, let's play the odds and say you won't. But are you sure you'll ever hear the gospel again? Yeah, I'm sure my mom's going to make me come to church. Well, I don't mean your mom's going to make you come to church. There's a difference between sitting in a pew and hearing the gospel. I see them all the time. Right? And here I'm, I'm just I'm thinking, man, this is good stuff. This is the gospel. And it's just, you know what I think every time? You're not hearing it. Right? You're not hearing it. And then you see people that when God has opened their heart and their eyes to hear the gospel, for some reason, they'll just be sitting here and just glued to it. Why? Because I preached better today than the other day? No. Just because God is tapping. My favorite was Lance. Lance always looked like he was going to throw up. That's how I knew Lance was awake, right? This is the idea here. You come when he calls. You don't know if you'll ever even hear the gospel again. You don't know if you'll ever be bothered by the gospel again. You don't know if the Lord will ever convict your sin again. The call of salvation is on God's timing, not yours. So let's establish that first. But here's what Isaiah 55 says. The call is available now. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, For he says, At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And since the call is going out to you this very moment, you're hearing what I'm saying. You're not just sleeping through this. You're hearing it. What should you do? Verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's the same thing Peter said, wasn't it? Repent and return. Same thing. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. In the Old Testament, the word for repentance is the word nakam, and it means to be sorry. That's what it means. Sometimes it's even used of God. For example, Genesis 6, when the Lord was sorry that he had made man. It's just sort of a regret. That, that, was, that was a regrettable thing. It's bad what happened. I'm sorry about it. That's what the Old Testament word repentance means. In the New Testament, we get a new word, which is metanaeo, and it means to change one's mind. And it's not just to turn around. It's to change your thinking. It, it's not just to stop doing what you were doing, although that's certainly implied if your thinking changes. It means to quit loving the sin and start hating the sin. It, it's to have a mind change about it. It starts with regret. You realize I have spent all my money for what was not bread. I spent all my wages for what did not satisfy. I have offended God and invited his reproach. And I have valued my own logic and my own opinion over God's. And because of that, I'm filled with regret and I am changing my mind. I am not doing that anymore. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Daniel used this a couple Wednesday nights ago. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. It's more than grief. It's grief that leads to a change of mind. Uh, I'll tell you the difference. We don't want Esau here. You remember Esau. 
Hebrews chapter 12 it says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Now that does not mean that Esau tried to repent with tears. He didn't. What the Bible means is that he never repented even though he really, really, really wanted the blessing. He cried and begged for the blessing. You remember the story? Starts with Esau out hunting, and Jacob wants the birthright. That's what he wants. It's his by the promise of God, but Isaac and Esau have sort of connived to steal it from him. But Jacob wants it. Now, he doesn't trust God for it. He takes matters in his own hands. And you remember, he cooks a bowl of pea soup. Lentil stew sounds better than pea soup. And he, Esau comes in and says, give me some of that red stuff there. And Jacob says, no problem. Give me your birthright. And the birthright here, everything in Genesis was about the birthright, right? Because what did they have except that, that God will give you this land? That was the promise to Abraham and to Isaac, and now it's coming to the boys. And it's the, I mean, it's the whole kit and caboodle, the land. And Esau was like, I don't give a rip about the land. I don't want the land. I don't care about the land. I want the stew. So all that God had promised as his eternal blessing, Esau thumbed his nose at it and said, I don't think it's worth a bowl of soup. Give me the soup. You can have the land. Talk about offending God. Keep everything that God wanted to give and take it for a bowl of soup. Well, that's what he does. Well, later on down the line, you remember that Jacob also wants the blessing, not just the birthright, but the blessing. And again, Isaac and Esau have connived to steal it from Jacob. It was rightfully his as a promise of God. And Jacob dresses up. You remember the whole story. And when Esau comes in and wants the blessing of his father, Isaac begins to tremble and is like, oh, we got a problem. I think I blessed the wrong boy. And you remember what Esau does? He falls down and he grabs a hold of Isaac and he begins to cry and he says, bless me too, even me, father. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, oh yeah, when Esau lost out on the blessing, he sought for it with tears. He begged and pleaded and cried that he might have the blessing of his father. But what did he not do? Repent. He never repented about his thoughts about the land, about his thoughts about the birthright. He never went before God and said, God, I'm so sorry I've offended you. It was wrong of me. He never did that. Look, there are people that will weep and cry over the consequences of their behavior. There are people that will weep and cry and, and beg and plead because they don't like their predicament. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the person who knows he is wicked and turns from his way. We're looking for the man who knows he is unrighteous and rejects his own thoughts. Do you have any idea how hard that is to do? It's hard, isn't it? Because the only person in this room you're pretty sure of is right all the time is yourself. That's true. Getting an argument, you've probably already been in an argument today. I, I had to settle one between or Doreen and Ole earlier today, right? An argument over which one was right. And of course it was Doreen. I mean, um, there was no question that was going to be the truth, right? But you ever get in an argument with somebody and you just know you're right and you just know they're wrong? All the time. Because your brain is so wired as to naturally think you're right. After all, it came from your brain. What could the problem be? It is very, very difficult to be willing to say everything about my thinking and logic knows this is the right way, and I am going to turn against that and do what God says instead. But you know what we call that? Repentance. It's when you begin to honor God's thoughts above your own thoughts. That's a hard, hard thing to do, to turn from your own way of thinking. We are called to surrender many things when we follow Christ. Our future, our safety, our reputation, our wealth, our comfort. But I don't know if any of them are as hard to surrender as our own faulty thinking, our own logic. It's hard to turn away from what we think is right, what we think is best. And God says here, you have to forsake your thoughts and return to the Lord. That implies that your way and your thoughts led you away from the Lord. So you're going to have to get rid of your ways and get rid of your thoughts and come back to the Lord. There's an ownership here of failure. There's an ownership here of rebellion. There's an ownership here of arrogance. It's very much like that prodigal who comes back to his father and says, well, I was wrong, right? I thought this was the way to walk. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned in your sight. What I thought was a foolproof plan, what I thought was the right way to walk, turns out I was wrong. Turns out I messed up and I'm coming back to you. And from a human standpoint, that kid should have got the biggest I told you so in the history of I told you so's. He should have got the boot 
and told to go back to the pig farm, which is exactly what his brother wanted to give him, right? But unimaginable to us comes in again this remarkable grace of God, this grace of God that promises children to the barren woman, this grace of God that promises dignity to that vile woman, this grace of God, which we read about this morning, that promises a future to the alien and a prodigy to the eunuch and says, I will welcome you back. And here we have the promise that if you will repent, if you'll turn from your way and turn from your thoughts and return to the Lord, it is a promise that God will have compassion on you. If you will come back to him, he will pardon but you've got to leave your thoughts behind. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he's wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it's written, He's the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. I really wish that not just the world, but that our church, not, and not just maybe the church, would grab a hold of that reality. Because we're always still so prone to put way too much stock in worldly wisdom, worldly thinking, worldly experience, worldly education. We are so tempted to do that. You better be careful. Because I can take you the leading PhDs from Harvard or Yale or Tech. <laughs> I don't know. Some other school, right? The, the leading brainiacs. And they can tell you all sorts of stuff. They can, they can tell you about plants and animals and economy and, and, and all sorts of different things. They're highly educated. And it's not that they're wrong about it. They can tell you a lot of stuff. But to a person, you know what one of them can't tell you? That's how to go to heaven. And of all the information that is vitally important, that's the stuff they don't know. They, they can tell you all about other things and not how to go to heaven. It's because the wisdom of this world doesn't comprehend the mind of God. You have to leave that behind. This morning we saw two Beatitudes sort of ingrained in our text. We talked about blessed are the poor in spirit, that poor one who, who is promised the kingdom of heaven. We talk about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be satisfied. Well, tonight I can throw two more Beatitudes at you. Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That is, they mourn over their sinfulness. They, they mourn over their arrogance. They mourn over their stubbornness. And blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. You know it is meek. It means strength under control. It means submissive. That's what this person is. He's realized his sinful ways and his sinful thinking. He's realized that, that he didn't know what he thought he knew, and it's got him in trouble. And he's come back to the Lord, and he said, You know what? I'm handing over the keys. I'm handing over the reins. You are in charge now. You call the shots. I don't want to do it. I want you to do it. But when you selfishly stick to your guns, when you make excuses before God, you're never going to be saved. But here he says, look, do you want to respond to God while he's calling to you? Then this is what it takes. Get rid of your thoughts, get rid of your ways, and run to the Lord. And if you do, he'll have compassion. Romans 10, 13 says, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. John 6, 37, Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Who promises compassion before you ever even repent? God does. It, it, you know, you, you maybe have had a time in your life where you, you had a sweet thing and you wanted to marry her and you were like, I really want to ask her. I just don't know what she'll say, right? And it sure does set your mind at ease if she'll sort of send you an incognito signal ahead of time that if you will ask me less, I will say yes, right? Did you ever give any of those hints, Tammy? Like, you never gave, well, no wonder it took so far long to ask. It's partly your fault. God does that. God's like, if you'll come back, I'll give you compassion. I, I'm not going to weigh it out. I'm not going to put you before a panel. I'm not going to make you fill out an application. If you'll return, I will be compassionate. And then my favorite phrase, he will abundantly pardon. What's the difference between a pardon and abundantly pardon? Uh, I can't say for sure, but maybe it's something like a promise that if you come to him, he will forgive every sin you've ever committed. Well, that would be awesome. That's a pretty big pardon. Well, what if it includes every sin that you're currently committing? That's a really big pardon. What if thrown into the equation is every sin you will ever commit? That's what we call an abundant pardon, right? Immunity. I, I will abundantly pardon you. If you will turn from your ways and turn from your thoughts and come to me, I'll have compassion and abundantly pardon. Psalm 103.8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He'll not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. That's the God we run to. It's the God we respond to. And the point to be made there is that this is an available call. At least it's available tonight. It's available right now because you're here and you heard it. It's by God's sovereign prerogative that you are here and that you did hear it. There's plenty of people that aren't, and then that's all in the sovereign framework of God. But you're here by his divine decision, whether your parents made you come or it was too hot in your house and you knew the church was air-conditioned or whatever the reason. You're here by the divine pleasure of God so that you would hear God's call. And the offer is open right now. The Lord can be found right now. He is near right now. But you must seek him while he can be found. You must call upon him while he is near. You must forsake your ways and you need to turn your back on your thoughts and you need to come to him. And he says, if you will, I will not leave you hanging. I will not humiliate and embarrass you. I will have compassion on you and I will abundantly pardon you that's the promise of God that's the way his call operates I don't know how many more times you'll hear the call I don't know how that works God is gracious he typically lets people hear it a lot more often than they should have but I don't know how long you have but you have tonight and I know what the wise move is that when he calls to respond to him when he offers his hand to take it How many times do you have to extend your hand to someone and have them slap it away before you quit extending your hand? That's the question. We saw the Lord do it with Israel. He said, all day long I have held out my hand to a stubborn and obstinate people. But then we found out in Romans 11 that he says, that's it. I gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see, not ears to hear, not down to this very day. Enough. Adrian Rogers used to tell the story and liken it. It's not really a story, it's an illustration. To like a forest and a fire blows through. And the first time the fire goes through, man, it just blazes and blazes and blazes. And then another fire comes through a few years later, and it burns still because there's some new growth, and it burns a little bit, but not like it did that first time because a lot of those old trees are dead. And then it comes through again, and it burns even less. And then the last time it comes through, it really just smolders and smokes because there's really nothing left to burn. And, and then before long, the fire doesn't even really affect it anymore. In fact, it won't even catch anymore. It can't even light it anymore. It's, it's burned over. Adrian Rogers used to liken that to men hearing the gospel, that there are times when the gospel comes to your heart and, man, it just tears you up, right? It just lights you up, convicts you and grabs your heart and rends it and squeezes. And the more you say no and the more the fire passes, boy, it just gets to where it doesn't even bother you anymore. Can you imagine the horror of being under the judgment of God in your sin and God calling you to salvation and you not even be able to hear it? That's a terrifying reality. Seek the Lord while he may be found. This is an anticipated call. It is worth it, but it is an available call to you tonight to trust in him. So do so. Let's pray. Father, we come to you because you are God, and we thank you, God, that you are a gracious and merciful God to sinners. I am a sinner. I need a gracious God. I thank you that you call sinners to yourself. I thank you, God, that you are merciful to us. Lord God, we thank you for saving us in spite of what we are. And I just pray tonight, God, that as your call goes out, that sinners would respond to it. God, that they would, even in their heart, even in their mind, come to you and say, Lord, you got it, you win. I'm leaving my thoughts and my ways. I want to be yours. I'm coming to you. Forgive me. Save me. You can have it all. Lord God, I pray that tonight, as you call, they answer. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for salvation. It's in his name I pray. Amen.